Tonight, Dr. Blevins is going to preach the parables, and he is going to be the father of the prodigal son. And I would like for you to give a very warm welcome to Eliezer, the prodigal son's father, as he enters. And the fish hook 
answer to the attention of those farmers and they listen to the spiritual application. So many people preach on the parable of the sower and never get to that important point. In spite of all of the obstacles to the kingdom of God, in spite of the fact that the birds ate some of the seed and the thorns choked out some of the seed and the sun wilted under the plants, there still was a hundredfold harvest. And the farmer said, Jesus, how can that be? And he went on to say, the kingdom of God is just like that. From small beginnings, you have a great big results. Now, certainly it was a wonderful message. The fish hooks are glorious examples of how Jesus used a simple story in his preaching to call the attention of the people. Some Sunday you need to get up and preach and tell about the fish hooks and have your congregation say, what? And a lot of them will wake up and listen to the parable. It's so very exciting. Jesus told these simple stories and all of them have to do with the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God like? And Jesus would tell these simple stories. He told the story of servants going out in the field, hired laborers, <coughs> At daybreak, you would go into the city marketplace at 6 a.m. as the sun was coming up. And you would wait in the marketplace until you were fired. In the typical working hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., you got paid 20 cents for working 12 hours, no labor unions. At the end of the day, the landowner didn't even have to pay you. Jesus told about a farmer who went down to hire some people to work in his vineyard. And sure enough, some worked 12 hours. He would go back later in the day and hire more laborers, promise them the same wage. And finally, just an hour before quitting time, he hired a man to work one hour. And then, of course, the steward came to pay off the workers. They worked all day. They were sweating. The man had worked uh, some 12 hours out there plucking the grapes. And when the season for grapes comes in, you've got to get them all in one day's time if you're going to have good wine. So he kept hiring people all day long. The chief steward came along. And paid the man who worked twelve dollars twenty cents. Then he went on paying twenty cents one denarius. And the man who worked twelve dollars was standing there watching the man who worked one hour. When the chief steward came up and gave him twenty cents, he said, "What?" He couldn't believe it. The man who worked twelve dollars got paid the same as one who worked one hour. And all the farmers standing around listening to Jesus said, how can that be? Even today, when people read that story, they still say, "Why?" Wow, that's one of the few parables that will capture your attention even today because it sounds so unjust, even in today's world. And Jesus used the spiritual truth that the kingdom of God is a gift. There's nothing that we can do to earn our way into the kingdom of God. It was up to the landowner what he's going to pay. And the chief steward said to the man who worked one hour, well, what did I promise you this morning in the marketplace? And the man said, 20 cents. He said, shut up and go on home. <laughs> that was bound to awaken the audience uh, listening uh, nearby, as you can well imagine. Jesus once told about children playing in the marketplace. They were playing funeral and wedding, the two common games. And, of course, those were the main attractions in the Bible in time and ancient college time. Uh, big occasions for weddings. We celebrated seven days for weddings. Weddings were always on a Wednesday, so all the relatives would move in on uh, one Wednesday. We'd party the whole week to the next. The greatest thing that could happen to you in the ancient world is to be invited to a wedding feast. Have you ever noticed how often Jesus compared the kingdom of God to a wedding feast? If the courier came with an invitation to a wedding feast, you rejoice. You could eat and drink all you wanted for seven days. Usually in Galilee, where I live, the basic food was bread. You very seldom got meat. Even uh, also seldom did you get vegetables. You had bread every day. The father would work all day in the marketplace out in the vineyard. Twelve hours, if he got paid the one denarius, he'd come home, buy enough a week to make flour, to make nine loaves of bread the next day. And when Jesus taught us to pray for daily bread, it certainly was very true of our day and time. And we would eat out in the open court gardens. And we would allow the poor people to come in and stand around the walls and watch us eat. That was sort of the 
pastime for poor people as they've ever seen food quite like that, much as you Western people watch the soap opera on TV. <laughs> they would come and watch us eat. And so festivities and feasting, and the last night was so important when the bridegroom came to find his bride and take her back to his home. And uh, so often Jesus told parables about the wedding things. Uh, other very popular occasion was uh, death itself and the funeral. <coughs> women were very much involved in funerals. Uh, we Jews believed that women had brought death into the world, and so they were responsible for anointing and washing the body. And if, as a male, we came near a dead body, we were unclean and could not go into the temple. Even today, Orthodox rabbis in your day have to avoid driving to a cemetery or they will become unclean. The women would wash the body anointed, and we didn't believe in embalming. On the third day, the women would take the body to the tomb. That's why women were so involved in the burial of Jesus, by the way. And then there would be flute players. Widow women would be paid to uh, a cry. And we made a great deal out of death. We got it all out of our systems. And Joseph and said you could hear a Jewish funeral from a mile away. He just screamed and hollered, or the women did at least. It was a good job for widow ladies. It was not much use for them otherwise. And they could cry at funerals and get paid. So those were the two big occasions. And Jesus then talked about children in the marketplace playing wedding or funeral. That would surprise most people if children didn't have time to play in the ancient world. He sent his a young boy who was five and started to work with his father. A young girl started cleaning and cooking when she was five years of age. And it's a very different kind of world. In the Western world, you praise children and children are the center point of life. But the ancient world, children played a secondary role. They weren't even allowed in the feast. They had to stay out in the courtyard. And so as Jesus told about children playing in the marketplace, uh, all of the farmers standing around would have said, Oh, oh children out playing. They should be out in the fields gathering up the rocks. And Jesus could talk about the kingdom of God in reference to children playing in the marketplace so caught up in their games they do not even hear uh, anything around them and the kingdom of God is like that. In Israel, people were not aware that the kingdom of God had broken into the world. So it certainly caused a great big plot in reference <laughs> to the kingdom of God. Jesus often talked about the kingdom of God is for everybody. And in Luke's Gospel, he talks about the Samaritan. You know the famous story, and all the people standing around were quite amazed about the man who was beaten on the side of the road. Of course, it was a very difficult road, an 18-mile journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. You started 3,000-some feet above sea level, and you ended up 1,300 feet below sea level on an 18-mile road. Jesus put the story on that road that everybody knew about. In fact, the local people called it the Valley of the Shadow of Death. So many people had died along the road. Someone had started out late from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he never went alone. He always went in a caravan. And so he was alone and was beaten and robbed and left for dead. Jesus talked about the priestly figures coming down the road. There were 20,000 priests and Levites in Jewish temple, and they only served two weeks out of the year. So the priest had been there in Jerusalem to serve his high and holy task, being in the temple. He was on his way home where he would be praised as being a holy person. So when he sees a dead person in the road, he passes on the other side. It would make him unclean for 30 or 40 days. Uh, just before Jesus was born, the Samaritan slipped down one night and threw human bones all over the Jewish temple and made it unclean for many a day. Can you imagine Samaritans doing that? We hated and despised those people. And here, the priest passed by on the other side, the Levite, who also served in the temple two weeks out of the year, also could not touch the dead. Imagine what embarrassment to return home, everybody expecting this high and glorious and holy person, and he would walk in unclean, and so he passed by on the other side. All the audience, just imagine you in the audience hearing Jesus telling the story. Now they expected the hero of the story to come would be a Jewish layman. And Jesus said, And down the road came a Samaritan. And all the crowd said, 
you Western people that put so much high life on the shepherds. They were dirty, unclean. And if you read uh, documents of the period of time of my life, they were hated as spies for being robbers. Only thing worse than being a shepherd was being a tanner. For very few reasons, a Jewish woman could divorce her husband, and one reason was if he ever became a tanner, she could divorce him. <laughs> Tanners were at the bottom because they worked with these animal skins and were unclean. It's very interesting, the book of Acts, Simon Peter is the house of a tanner when he receives that vision that Gentiles should be included. The shepherds were dirty, unclean. And it's very interesting, the Gospel of Luke brings the shepherds in at the Christmas story. Can you imagine them, the shepherds in the Christmas story? And Matthew has those stargazers from the east and their beautiful robes. And old Luke brings in those dirty, smelly shepherds that is the first to see the baby Jesus. What an insult in God for the Luke. But they're the first ones to hear the message of the angels, these unclean uh, shepherds. And so uh, you have to recognize the shepherds being very concerned about their own livelihood wouldn't leave 99 sheep to go find one. Then Jesus told about a girl of marriageable age, she would have been about 12, her dowry she had sewed in a headband. The women in my day and time in the villages of Galilee would take the dowry money, sew it in a headband, and go down to the village well with their mothers if they had not found a husband by the time they were 13. The village well is the most important place in Galilee. You notice even in the Old Testament how many important things happen at wells. It's much like the mall in the modern world. People down there at malls. The women would come down in the evening to carry out their duties of drawing the water, carrying it two miles back to the village while the men relaxed on the front porch, so to speak. So the women would go down, get their water. The available women would circle the well. The available men are not found wise yet would come down to the village well and they would go counterclockwise and the women would go clockwise and the Men look at the women's headband to see how much money was available for marriage. Jesus told that little girl who lost one of her silver coins for marriage. And all the women standing around the well said, What young girl who had not gotten married but lose one tenth of the dowry? And Jesus said she went back home and searched in the dirt floor until she found it. And there was great rejoicing in the land. One thing is so very important. Now we come to my story, and I want you to pay very careful attention to it. The story of two sons. It's very painful to me because it's part of my life, so I hope you will understand that. I, the father, had several daughters, but two sons being so very, very important. When a daughter was born, a Jewish father would mourn 30 days because it meant money went out of the family. If you were a poor man and had five daughters, you were doomed to support those women the rest of your life. You can never retire. Sons brought money into the family, so we always rejoiced at profitable weddings. If you're going to deal with love and romance, make sure there's a little bit of money in it. I would say that to all of you. I have two sons. I want you to hear their stories this evening and look at it from two perspectives and also look at it from my perspective as father. I want to introduce, first of all, my son Alexander, who has been made the central figure of this whole story. But in reality, he is not, as you will discover. Alexander has been called the so-called prodigal son. He is going to tell you his story, and then his brother is going to come. His name is Simona, and he is going to speak about his life. Let us now turn to my son, Alexander. I am Alexander, and I would like to speak to you about my life in Galilee. You've met my father. I worked in his vineyard for years. It was dull and boring, as you could well expect, to live in a small town in Galilee where you had to work all day long in the vineyard and there wasn't much excitement going on. I yearned to leave the small town 
and go across the Sea of Galilee where there were ten Greek cities called the Decapolis. Greek city-states where Greek was spoken, excitement in the land, all kinds of activities for a young person. Finally came to my mind, I will go to my father and demand my part of the inheritance. And let me say to you, there wasn't much future for me anyway and for a case of my defense. In Galilee, on the vineyard, when the father died, the eldest son got two-thirds of the inheritance, and all the other sons had to share one-third. So at best, I could only get one-third of the inheritance. So I decided to do a rather rash kind of thing. I would go to my father while he yet lived, which was unheard of, and demand my part of the inheritance. And when people in the village heard that I had done that, they all said, wow. Yes, it was terrible. It was an insult and offense to my father. For it was then I had said to him, I wish you were dead. It was unheard of in Galilee to want your part of the inheritance while your father was alive. It was a direct insult in the whole village. And the whole village would have taken it seriously. And bear in mind, my name time, Villages were close-knit. All the homes were almost back-to-back -back within the central village. And the greatest offense that could happen would be to be thrown out of the village and you'd have to live out in the hinterland. All the village heard of my rash deed. I went to my father and demanded my part of the inheritance. I was somewhat flabbergasted. But my father didn't start yelling and screaming as most Palestinian fathers would have done. You see, in Judaism, the elders were respected. As long as they lived, they ruled the house. The father could be 80 and the son 60. The father could still wish the death penalty upon the son. To speak out against an older person was unheard of. And in our local synagogue, the oldest members were the rulers of the synagogue. And for a young son to go to his father and demand his part of the inheritance was unheard of in my day and time quickly cashed in my part of the land because there was so much murmuring in the village, I knew I would be killed if I stayed around much longer. I took my part of the inheritance and went across the Sea of Galilee to the ten Greek cities and started a wonderful style of life. I must say, I have an elder brother. It was to do the elder brother to reconcile any differences in the family between sons and father or sons and sons. And my elder brother just took his part of the inheritance and didn't say a word and made no attempt to reconcile me and my father together. I went away to life in the great city. For several years, I had a wonderful time. City life is exciting and different. Met a lot of people, very interesting and exciting as well. Then the famine came to the land. In fact, within a short period of time, there were over 10 famines in that part of our world. I ended up with nothing. How many have ever had experience of having nothing? You did through the Great Depression, I understand. Some of you did. I ended up with nothing and ended up on a pig farm. Can you imagine? All the Jews listening to my story would have said, oh, Ending up on a pig farm? But the grapes of pig was even worship that we Jews paid in the size of animals being unclean. When I was in a foreign country, of course, in times of a famine, they would always give the worst possible duties to strangers in the land. I ended up feeding the pigs. We feed them the carob bean, not the variety that was grown for eating. It was the wild carob bean. It had tiny black berries on it that were bitter as could be. The carob bean vines were only used for firewood and the stoves to bake bread, and they were only used to feed the pigs. I got so hungry, I ate some of those bitter berries, but they wouldn't fill my stomach. And no one was caring for me over and over again. That theme runs throughout the story. So one day, my stomach was empty, sick of caring for the pigs. I said, I will rise and go home. Now, the repentance that is talked about there in the story is not any real repentance at all. My father's servants would have it better. 
In my day and time, there were three classes of servants. Or the bondsmen, who were almost like family members in the family. Lesser servants, who helped out in the family. And the hired servants were those who were not a part of the family and lived an independent kind of life and earned their own money. And it suddenly came to me, well, I'll go back and become a hired servant. That would mean I would have an independent kind of life. I could repay my father for what I had taken. And it was the son's duty to take care of the father in old age. As an independent person, I could live apart from my father to save enough money to pay him back. It wasn't really the tennis, but I think it was a clever idea. I must say to you, I was frightened and scared out of my skin as I made the way back across the Sea of Galilee and arrived near the village. I knew the village people still hated me. And when anyone had broken the law and returned home, they would form a gauntlet outside the village. You had to run between two lines of men. And as you ran through the lines, they would beat you with sticks and stones to try to punish you for your offense. And then they had heard that I had lost my money to the Gentiles. And there was a ceremony called the cutting off of a person when you were cut out of the family and the village. And I knew that would happen to me as well, but I was ready to miss it. As I arrived near home, and the people heard I was coming, a gauntlet had formed, and I knew I'd have to face it, but suddenly I looked, and I saw my elderly father running down the hillside and through the gauntlet himself, meeting me and throwing himself around my neck because it was a son's duty to bow down and kiss his father's hand or at least his feet, and he wouldn't even allow me to do that by grabbing me around the neck and he was kissing me over and over and over again. I couldn't believe my eyes. He put his arm around me and we walked together into the village and all the village people standing around said, How can this be? In the ancient world, in my day and time, Elderly men never ran just beneath their dignity. In fact, your station in life could be determined by the way you walk. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw my father running like some lowly servant or slave. Coming and hugging my neck. As we walked into the village, he took off his signet ring and told the servants to put it on my hand which would identify me as one to be loved in the village and to be welcomed back. And he gave me shoes to go on my bare feet. And in the ancient world, you wore shoes and meant you weren't a slave. It was very important. Slaves always got their feet dirty. By the way, the Christian church selected that very word for the first office in the church. On some days, look in your Bible and see the word deacon has never been translated. If you translated it, it would be dirty feet people. Diakonos, through the dirt, in Greek. What if the pastor would announce on Sunday morning a meeting of the dirty feet people? Slaves went barefoot and waited on the tables and got their feet dirty, and the officers in the church would be that as well. All of you have been called to be dirty feet people. But I put on shoes, a sign that you were more than a slave. My father said, kill the fatty calf. Give a great banquet in the village and let the village know that you're welcome back. And they would divide the calf in quarters and put it in ovens and roast it. And the village feast would bring about 100 people into the household. And I suddenly remember, well, I want to be more than a hired servant. And you'll notice that I don't even mention that word again as I talk to my father. I see true love and grace. I wasn't expecting that. That took me aback. And I was willing to throw myself on the mercy of my father. The people who heard this story said, well, Now, friends, I would like to introduce you to my other son, the elder son. Will you greet Simona with a nice warm welcome to Hills Alex? Here, this runaway son 
took my father's living and wasted it in a far land on prostitutes. It is terrible when a young person like that would run away. That's why it's so good even in your churches today to preach about the people who aren't there on Sunday. <laughs> preach about the one that run away, uh, teenagers and the homeless and those on drugs. Uh, that's the kind of thing you need to do. This here are three ooads for my younger brother. Ooad, ooad, ooad. What son would treat his father in such a way? Of course, I've been out in the fields working all day as I always did, every day from sun up to sundown. This can be a round of nothing, you understand. <laughs> a loyal son. A loyal son should be rewarded. I have heard news of what my brother had done in the distant lands in the Decapolis. I was coming in from the field, the sun was going down, and I couldn't quite believe my ears. I heard the rhythm of music, and in my day and time, each feast had a particular kind of music used. And from the rhythm of the music which I heard, I knew it was a great feast, and all the village would be there, over a hundred people. And I said, Wow, yeah, can this be? So I got up to the house, and I called over some of the boys. The kids always played in the front yard because they weren't allowed into the feast, of course. We would always throw out something for them to eat afterwards. And I said, What's going on? And the boys said, your father has greeted home your lost brother, killed the fatty cab, and they're having a great feast. I blinked my eye. First of all, I wanted to know if he had come home rich or poor. That was very important. And I kept on asking him questions, as the Greek would indicate there in the story. I kept on asking him questions about what was going on. And I couldn't believe my ears at this terrible brother of mine who had run away from home had come back home again. And suddenly my father came out of the house and berated me. He says, it's your duty as the elder son to be in the feast. Yes, it was true. The elder son always met the guest at the door, barefooted, indicate you were ready to be the servants of the people who had come to the feast. In the Middle East, we were so concerned about hospitality. Your duty is to stand at the door, welcome the guests with bare feet. It's your duty to circulate among the guests, make sure they have enough to eat, compliment them, and uh, so forth. Son, you're not living up to your duty. Come on in to the feast. And I started berating my father. That was an insult in itself. You never argued with your father in public. And I did, and I refused to go in. And I call my brother, this son of yours has come back and has wasted your living. And this is a very interesting point by not knowing our Greek language. We had two words for love, bios and zoe. At the beginning of the story, as Jesus told it, my brother came, my younger brother, and wanted to divide life. That's the word in Greek, bios. Life in terms of food, clothing, shelter, and inheritance. At the end of the story, my father said to me, This, your brother who was lost, has been found and now lives, using Zoe, quality life. Your brother has found himself. I was angry, and I think you can understand the way I insulted my father. I refused to enter the banquet, refused to greet my brother. I would say to you, I've kept all the laws of Judaism, and I've stayed in the land. Just give me another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Simona, for your story. You do have bitterness against me in your heart. Uh, which son was obedient to me and which son insulted me? They both insulted me. The younger son demanding his part of inheritance while I still live, going away to a far country and throwing it away on the Gentile. My elder son insulted me by refusing to come into the banquet and carry out his duties. But notice I went out to both. I ran down the pathway to my younger son and welcomed him back home. And I ran out and found my elder son and invited him to the feast. 
Both sons were disobedient. But Jesus used my elder son as the point of interpretation for all of three parables in Luke 15. So often preachers in your day and time preach about the prodigal son every time they use this story and miss the whole point. You only have part of it. Elder son symbolized for the Jewish people the self-righteousness of Pharisees and Sadducees, the attitude which they would take to sinners and outcasts. So to start with the one lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, start at the end of the chapter with my elder son, the self-righteous attitude that people often take today in the church. So easy for you to preach about lost people and lost sons and Everyone would say, Amen. Terrible for a young son to treat his father that way. Say, Amen. Amen. No one ever says that for the self-righteous person, the Sunday school pins on the top of their shoulders to their toes, and those who have kept every meeting of the church are very self-righteous. The last place some sinners who come in your world would be to a church service because they're so condemned. It's easy to look through the eyes of a prodigal Difficult to look through the eyes of my elder son. Many people in your day and time have called my story the gospel within the gospel. For Jesus came forth and went out to us when we were in need and brought us back home. As you approach the Easter season, let the people know the surprise. Prodigals and the self-righteous are welcome in the kingdom of God. And the people standing around hearing Jesus say, Prodigals and the self-righteous are welcome into the kingdom of God. And they all say, 